Good morning, everyone. He was a leader of a huge group of refugees, some two million people. That was an enormous undertaking. And he was struggling to keep on top of the task of leadership because he was trying to micromanage everything. His father-in-law, Jethro, took him aside and made a very sound suggestion. Let's look at it in Exodus 18. Moses, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Now remember, Jethro was a priest of God and he was Moses' father-in-law, and he and Moses with Aaron had together offered a, a sacrifice of gratitude to God just before Jethro and Moses had this discussion. Moses listened to the man of God who was bringing the word of God to him through the Spirit, and his counsel, as the text said, his counsel came from God. Moses, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. Isn't it interesting how history repeats itself? Come now in time to the early Christian church and we have much the same situation. As we were reminded by Pastor Fay last week, the early Christian church in Jerusalem was led by uh, the 12 apostles. And the scripture says that the number of disciples was increasing and the leaders were being run off their feet. You remember that the Grecian Jews, among the new converts, complained about the apparent neglect of their people, particularly the widows, and that they were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Racial discrimination, they claimed. I love the attitude and the approach the apostles took. They listened to the complaint, but they didn't retaliate in the same manner, which is so easy for us to do, isn't it? It's... Um, very easy when someone snaps or brings criticism or rebuke and it's very easy for us to rise up on our hind legs and immediately snap back in the same manner. But look what the apostles did. Firstly, they didn't take criticism lightly. They listened. Secondly, they then gathered the, everyone together. Acts 6 uh, verses 2 to 7 says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together. Then they took their time to carefully consider the issues. Was it a fair comment? What could they do about it? How could they best deal with it? Then they presented the whole situation. In other words, they gave the background, why, the condition, why things had happened the way they did. And then they gave their thoughts on the matter. And they said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. And then they offered a spirit-led solution. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And verse 5 says, This proposal pleased the whole group they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. I'm glad we don't use names like that today. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And the result? So the word of God spread. 
the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The word of God spread so much so in Jerusalem that the Jewish leaders became alarmed. Thousands were being added to the church and as we studied last week, it culminated in Stephen being called before the assembly of the priests and the leaders and it resulted in his death. Their attitude sadly was we'll persecute this upstart movement out of existence. Anything that doesn't conform, conform to our preconceived ideas, our opinions is wrong and we'll squash it, this threat to, um, to our way of thinking. And just as Stephen was being stoned, he had a vision of heaven opened and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He saw Jesus not seated, but standing. This seated is a reference to other passages of Scripture where Jesus is seated at, at the right hand of the Father. But now he's standing in support of his servant. And it's also in contrast to um, Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin because that's where uh, Stephen had been tried. Jesus once stood there accused. Now he stands vindicated. Here in the story of Stephen's vision is a picture of the Saviour standing beside those who testify on his behalf. This is an, an amazing and a comforting thought. Saul was watching the killing of Stephen. And I'm going to read from Acts chapter 8, uh, verses 1 to 4, and it's the, um, the Passion Translation. I want to thank Pastor Fay for steering me uh, in the direction of this particular translation. I, I really enjoy it. But here's, um, here's verse 1. Now Saul agreed to be an accomplice to Stephen's stoning and participated in his, in his execution. From that day on, a great persecution of the church in Jerusalem began. They didn't wait. They didn't wait. It was from that day on. Incredible, isn't it? All the believers scattered into the countryside of Judea and among the Samaritans, except the apostles who remained behind in Jerusalem. God-fearing men gave Stephen a proper burial and mourned greatly over his death. Then Paul mercilessly persecuted the church of God, going from house to house into the homes of believers to arrest both men and women and drag them off to prison. As I read this, I had pictures in my mind of invading armies, uh, smashing into homes and, and dragging people outside to be shot or, or thrown into railway carriages or to be eventually imprisoned or annihilated. You know the pictures I'm talking about. I was going to include some photos of some of those situations, but I just found them too distressing. But imagine that happening in Jerusalem and the fear amongst the, the Jewish Christians. And this persecution was being done in Jerusalem in the name of Jehovah. Look what was going on, verse 4. This is what also is happening. Although the believers were scattered by persecution, they preached the wonderful news of the word of God wherever they went. This is what God really wanted them to do. Look back in, in chapter 1 of Acts and verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit had come upon them and they had been witnesses in Jerusalem, but God wanted them to go to the rest of the world. The persecution of the early church became the impetus for the spread of the gospel. Let's look at Acts 8. Philip travelled to a Samaritan city and preached to them the wonderful news of the Anointed One. The crowds were eager to receive Philip's message and were persuaded by the many miracles and wonders he performed. Now, the Aramaic translation of this passage indicates that they did more than just hear the good news. They actually silenced those who said anything against Philip's message. 
Acts um, 8, uh, verses 7 and 8. Many demon-possessed people were set free and delivered as evil spirits came out of them with loud screams and shrieks. And many who were lame and paralyzed were also healed. This resulted in an uncontainable joy filling the city. So here we have the Gospel Commission being carried out. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. Now, one of those who believed and was baptized was a man called Simon. Now, this was a fairly common name um, in those times. What is significant, though, is that Simon was a magician, and the Bible says he was steeped in sorcery. And the people thought he was someone really great, and so did he for that matter, and he told everybody he was too. But he believed the message, and he was baptised. When he saw the miracles that the apostles, and particularly Philip, were doing, he wanted some of the action. And he followed Philip everywhere astounded by the miracles and signs and enormous displays of power that he witnessed. Philip and John arrived to assist in the gospel work. They were praying that people might receive the Holy Spirit because the people had simply been baptised in the name of Jesus. In other words, they had had a head knowledge but not a heart conversion of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Peter and John placed the, their hands on people and they in turn received the Holy Spirit. Now, even though Simon was baptised, he was not really converted. And this comes through in what he asks. And let's have a look at verses 18 to 24. When Simon saw how the Holy Spirit was released through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he approached them and offered them money, saying, I want this power too. I'm willing to pay you for the anointing that you have so that I, may, I also may, can lay my hands on everyone and receive the Holy Spirit. It was the, uh, the power that he wanted, wasn't it? Peter rebuked him and said, your money will go with you to destruction. How could you even think that you could purchase God's supernatural gift with money? You'll never have this gift or take part in this ministry for your heart is not right with God. Now, the message paraphrases it like this. To hell with your money and you along with it. Why, that's unthinkable trying to buy God's gift. You'll never be a part of what God is doing by striking bargains and offering bribes. Change your ways and now ask the Father to forgive you for trying to use God to make money. I can see this is an old habit with you. You reek with money lust. Oh, said Simon, pray to the master that nothing like that will ever happen to me. It's possible to have a, a head conversion, but not a heart conversion. In fact, James 2 verse 19 says, and if we can go full screen on this one, please, crew, you believe in God, that there, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So even the demons have a, um, a, a head knowledge and, and acknowledge that there is God, but they, there's no heart conversion. And that was the same as with Simon. Now, I spoke to the teens last night on Zoom and told them to look for this piece of artwork, artwork that was coming because it's something that I think that you guys could do and have fun doing, and that is taking scriptural uh, text from scripture and illustrating them in something similar to the way that um, Jason Harrison has done it there on that and that so that's what I was referring to last night and I'd love to see some of uh, you take on this, the challenge to do some texts like that and then give them to us so we can put them up on the screen to share with with people here at, uh, in our online service let's go back to the story both Simon and the demons believe that God is God but they didn't have Christian faith. Jesus wasn't their personal Lord and Saviour. The Holy Spirit changes lives. It changes our motivation. It changes our way of thinking. It changes our desires. It changes our way of living. And our story changes now. 
And here we see a direct contrast between the story of Simon and our next character. We find Philip on the desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. He's been told by an angel to go there. This actually says a lot without many words. For an angel to give him instructions, Philip must have been in tune with God. He must have been in a constant relationship with God and used to being directed by God through the Spirit. Along the way, as you saw on Bethany's superb video, and thank you, Bethany, I really did enjoy that, and it looks just great. I especially love the baptism scene. Along the way, Philip encountered the Ethiopian who believed in the God of the Jews. He was the Minister of Finance in charge of the treasury of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. And he was on his way home from worshipping in Jerusalem. And he was, as he was travelling along in his chariot, he was trying to read a passage of scripture from Isaiah. Now, I think that this must have shown some real determination and passion from the Ethiopian. Have you ever tried reading in a car? Okay, that's not too bad, unless it's the street directory. Have you tried reading in a bus? A mm, little bit. Okay, but just imagine how hard it would have been lurching along in a chariot, bumping down a, a, a rough road, a dusty road, reading a scroll and trying to make sense of what was hard to read. We all know the story well. Philip was instructed by the Spirit to go and walk alongside the chariot. And when he did, he heard that the Ethiopian was reading from Isaiah. He asked the Ethiopian, if he understood what he was reading. The Ethiopian invited Philip into the chariot to explain the prophecy of the Messiah, the sacrifice mentioned in the scriptures and what the scriptures were talking about. It was the message of, of salvation. It was the gospel story, the good news. Let's have a look at just uh, a couple of these texts, Acts 8, 34, 35. The Ethiopian asked Philip, Please, can you tell me who the prophet is speaking of? Is it himself or another man? Philip started with this passage and shared with him the wonderful message of Jesus. You'll notice that Philip started right where the Ethiopian was, right where his understanding was, and he used that as the starting point for the gospel message. The Ethiopian was converted, and as soon as they came to some water, and remember that they're out in the desert, he asked Philip to baptise him. Let's read it in verses 36 and 30 to 38. As they were travelling down the road, the man said, Look, here's a pool of water. Why don't I get it baptised right now? Philip replied, If you believe with all your heart, I'll baptise you. And the man answered, I believe that Jesus is the anointed one, the Son of God. The Ethiopian stopped his chariot and they went down into the water and Philip baptised him. I was once asked if I would approve of baptising a person who was still smoking. I said yes. The person asking the question was rather taken aback with my response, but consider, who's to say that we aren't harbouring some other sin that we would count greater than smoking. All sin is sin. If a person has accepted Christ as their saviour, then that's all that's needed for baptism. It's the indwelling Holy Spirit working in our lives that gives us the victory over our sins, be it smoking, drinking, gambling, bad language, violence, pornography, false witness, gossip, deceit, <clears throat> putting people down, theft, temper, love of possessions, anything else. Baptism is the outward sign of our acceptance of Jesus as our saviour. It's telling the world that I want Jesus to rule in my life and have his spirit guide and change my life for him. And it's entirely separate from the 28 fundamentals or church membership. Acts 8, 39 and 40. <clears throat> but when they came to the water, Philip was suddenly snatched up 
by the Spirit of the Lord and instantly carried away to the city of Ashdod, where he reappeared, preaching the gospel in that city. The man never saw Philip again. He returned to Ethiopia, pardon me, <clears throat> he returned to Ethiopia full of great joy. Philip, however, travelled on to all of the towns in that region, bringing them the good news until he arrived in Caesarea. Philip just disappeared, carried away by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, here's a, par a parallel with the way Jesus appeared to the men on the road to Emmaus and then just disappeared again. Luke 24, 31 to 30 says, Joining them at the table for supper, he took bread and blessed it and broke it, then gave it to them. All at once their eyes were opened and they realised it was Jesus. Then suddenly, in a flash, Jesus vanished before their eyes. Just think about the Ethiopian. He returned to Ethiopia full of great joy. Have you noticed the expression of candidates um, at a baptism as they come up out of the water? Have you noticed the expression on their faces? And how do the people also in the congregation react? Full of great joy. Somehow I, I doubt that this was the experience of Simon. It seems he went through uh, the motions for his own gain. In fact, we historic, historians of that time tell us that there was a Simon who actually turned against the people of God um, and it is thought to be this same Simon. Let's turn our attention back to Philip, though, for a moment. It would appear that Philip stayed on in Caesarea, and certainly he was there during the time of Paul. On one of the missionary journeys, Paul <coughs> returned back through Caesarea, and Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, um, tells us, <coughs> Then we, Paul and his party, went on to Caesarea and stayed for several days in the home of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven deacons and the father of four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Philip was one of the seven deacons of the church in um, Jerusalem. He was a man of wisdom and of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. And when persecution came, he became a preacher. He was also known as the evangelist. He was a person who lived in the Spirit, he set an example by the way he lived. All his daughters were followers of God and they were all prophetesses used by the Spirit. For us to be led by the Spirit means we must also be living in the Spirit. So what does living in the Spirit mean? Let's look at Philip's example and just have a look at some of the characteristics of living in the Spirit. First of all, he lifted up Jesus. What are we lifting up? What's the centre of our lives? What's the, the theme of our conversations? Do we start where they are? For example, COVID-19 is, an, is a, a great starting point. When people start talking negatively about it all, we can actually talk positively to people. We can, we can talk of hope, we can future, we can use it as a way of lifting up Jesus. The second thing, he inspired a hunger for God. You remember when he was preaching in Samaria, the people listening wouldn't let anybody else talk against what he was saying. They wanted to hear the word of God. Now, hunger in, infers food. <laughs> we eat and we enjoy. There's a new family down our street. We, we met them the other day when we were doing our... COVID-19 exercising and I said to the little fella what are you interested in and he thought for a bit and he says eating and I thought fair enough <laughs> a bit later on in the conversation his mother said oh but you remember we went to so and so he said no no I don't remember she said you ate so and so Oh, yes, he remembered then. So food was definitely high on his priorities. But 
this word hunger means, you know, refers us to food. We want to eat it and enjoy it. And it's so good, we want to come back and we want to eat some more. And that's what was happening with the people in Samaria. That's what was happening with the Ethiopian. And that's what's happening here in our church too. I don't know how many of you have been able to tap into Pastor Faye's um, daily readings of the Word of God. It's really, really cool. And uh, Georgie has a, a mail out that she's sending out each, each day. It's called Faith for Today. And there's a passage of scripture and, 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 a, and a discussion on there that's, that's being sent out every, every day. Both of these things are really, really good, as well as our, our, our own daily study of the word. Our spiritual growth only occurs when spiritual food is taken in. And these crowds with Philip and, and the Ethiopian is an example of it. These crowds were eager and ready to receive the message. They responded and they went on to seek the Holy Spirit, the life changer. The third point is Philip connected to the supernatural God. The crowd saw the miracles that he did through, through God. Even the skeptics were converted and Simon was an example of that. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes about when we hear the word, we believe the word, we are baptized and we become empowered through the, the Spirit of God and he gives us our spiritual gifts. It means being connected, being plugged in through the word, through prayer, through the promptings of the spirit in our mind and our lives. Fourth point is that he brought great joy, uncontainable joy. The good news of, of salvation is the positive news in a negative world today. But it's the joy of our knowing our sins are forgiven. The text says, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. And our fellowship is restored with God. He says, Abide in me that my joy might remain in you and that your joy may be full. And the Ethiopian returned home full of great joy. We have the assurance of salvation. We're baptised into Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living in our lives, prompting us and changing us to be more like Jesus, prompting our thoughts, our motives, our actions, our lifestyle. We have the joy of the Lord in our lives. We have the promise of the soon return of Jesus. Let's all enjoy living in and being led by the Spirit. And may we all live in the Spirit and in the joy of the Lord.